update on our uh, sanctuary heat. Hopefully, the heat will be repaired on Friday of this week. Uh, I, I, I guess I missed the weather forecast this morning. I guess I should have worn shorts today because it was like 65 or 67 degrees outside earlier. Uh, so we got, the, we got the sanctuary up to about, up to about 63 but uh, as it cooled off this afternoon, we just decided let's stay with let's stay with the uh, Fellowship Hall Bible Study. Uh, it's 69 degrees in here, I believe, or 68, uh, and the sanctuary is is several degrees cooler. But hopefully, hopefully, we'll be back up and running as normal in the sanctuary this coming Sunday. Uh, I'm not going to hold my breath every time I think we got something sorted out. It ain't always sorted out. So. We're gonna we're gonna have a plan and um, and and plan if you if you want to join us in the sanctuary plan dress accordingly. We have some ladies have their blankets. We had some folks with their jackets on this past Sunday. It was all fine and good. Uh, my my hat my Hungar- my beloved Hungarian hat got mixed reviews on Sunday. Some folks thought it was really great. Some folks thought it looked really ugly. I guess you you can please some of the people some of the time. But you cannot please all of the people all of the time. Oh well. Oh well. So, uh, that'll be our plan for Sunday. So hopefully we'll have some heat, more heat in the sanctuary than we've had. But I'm so thankful that it was just that one furnace that services that one room. The rest of our building was nice and toasty on Sunday morning. We had a good crowd in in Sunday school as well. So, take that uh, for what it's worth. Um, Any other housekeeping items that we need to be aware of? I don't know of any other announcements or... Anything, anything of, of too much importance as far as housekeeping is concerned? Well, let's dive into Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 is where we find ourselves this evening. We're going to pick up in verse 59. We left off in verse 58 last week, so we're going to pick up in verse 59 tonight. But before we do, as is normal, uh, we have people that ask very good questions. And uh, Miss Carol asked a very good question uh, last Wednesday evening at the end of our Bible study. And the question is, did the disciples carry weapons anywhere else? Um, we know uh, from, from verse 50, 55-ish uh, that Peter, Simon Peter cut off the ear of one of the high priest's servants. We, uh, the book of John told us that his name was Malchus. Um, and the book of Luke told us that Jesus repaired the ear. But um, Peter used a sword to cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. And so Miss Carol's question, a good question, did disciples carry weapons anywhere else? And so there's, uh, there's, the, there's the, the, the thought that we have to ponder for a moment. Um, we don't... First, let me, let me give you a biblical principle. This is not a biblical principle. It's just an evidentiary principle. My father's a CSI for the Greensboro Police Department. And he always says... An absence of evidence is not the same thing as evidence of absence. And let me, let me define those terms. Just because I didn't leave a fingerprint behind and they couldn't find that evidence does not mean that it's proof that I wasn't there. And so an absence of evidence is not the same thing as evidence of an absence. And so we, we kind of have to look at God's word in that lens. Just because something isn't stated in print doesn't mean it didn't happen. And so, just because it doesn't talk about the disciples being armed doesn't mean that they weren't ever armed. When Jesus sends out the twelve, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all uh, give uh, instructions where Jesus is commissioning his twelve apostles. And then Luke also has a commissioning of the seventy into, uh, into the Judean hill country. And so we have these, le- these different commissionings that Jesus gives in the Gospels. And in all of the commissionings, Jesus says, don't, don't carry any more money than you need. Don't carry any more shirts than you need. Don't, carry, don't even carry a walking stick. And so Jesus gives them instructions not to carry stuff. And so that would probably include weapons. We don't know that. But... We also have to know that Jesus, and, 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 and as, uh, as Pastor Jim likes to say from 
the old mad magazines back in the day, the merry band of misfits. Jesus and his merry band of misfits, uh, they lived an itinerant life. They were, they were in many ways so, sojourners across the, across the Galilean hill country and down into Samaria and into Judea. And so they, they did lots of camping. We know that they... They, they, they ate off the land. They were provided for by people's homes. We do know that many of the disciples were fishermen. I don't know how many fishermen don't carry a knife of some kind. Um, when I was a kid, my, my dad always taught me to carry my pocket knife in my pocket. And I've got a little knife everywhere I go. And the running joke between me and my father is, do you have your pocket knife on you? Well, I've got my pants on, don't I? And so it's, it's there. It's a given. And when I was in school, I was not allowed to carry it at school. And so I got, I got home, put it in my pocket where it belonged, and it was really good. But, but, so, the, so the disciples probably had a knife or, or something, maybe a, maybe a dagger, not necessarily a sword like we think of a big sword, long sword. Uh, but it may have been something shorter. It may have been something f- as a tool or something for personal protection. So we don't, we don't see that explicitly in Scripture, but... Uh, Pastor Pat last week highlighted a couple of verses in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 sheds a little bit of light on this. Verses 35 through 38. Uh, And so this is is immediately following the prediction of Peter's betrayal. And it's it's before uh, they go out to the Mount of Olives. But um, in verse 35 of Luke chapter 22... He also said, to, and, and this is only in Luke. There's not a parallel in, in Matthew, Mark, or John. But in Luke 22, he also said to them, When I sent you out without money bag, traveling bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? That's a reference back to the commissioning of the apostles into the mission field, which Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record. Not a thing, they said. And in verse 36, he said, And then he said to them, But now... Whoever has a money bag should take it, and also a traveling bag. And whoever doesn't have a sword should sell his robe and buy one. For I tell you, what is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless. Yet what is written about me is coming to its fulfillment. So they're, again, they're, they're fixing to head out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus knows that he's going to be betrayed. Jesus knows that that he's going to be crucified imminently. And so he is he's making sure that his disciples are prepared for the persecution to come. And so, yes, it was written about me that is coming to its fulfillment. In verse 38, Lord, they said, look, here are two swords. That is enough, he told them. So they carried swords out with them to the Garden of Gethsemane. So we see a reference very, very clearly here in Luke chapter 22 that there were at least two swords among the disciples. So one of those swords is very likely what Peter used to cut off the ear of the, of the servant of the high priest. And um, we also see pretty clearly here in Luke chapter 22 that this was, this was not prepare for offense. This was not prepare to go to battle or prepare to fight in an offensive way, but rather it was a preparation uh, to defend yourselves. You're going to be, they're going to be out to get you, they're going to chase you, you're going to be considered lawless, and you need to be prepared to defend yourself if that time comes. So, that is the only reference that I have found in the past week where there's, there's an arming of the disciples with, with weapons, per se. So, any questions about that or thoughts? That's the only reference that I have found in the past week in, in the four Gospels of Jesus giving instructions to carry along a, a sword. So take, take that for what it's worth. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's wrong to make efforts to defend ourselves and keep our family safe. But Jesus also said when Peter struck off mouth this ear last week that the kingdom of heaven is not like this. We don't, we don't advance the kingdom of heaven through violence. So there's nothing wrong with self-defense, but we don't, we don't use the gospel as a bludgeon. Uh, we don't advance God's kingdom uh, in, with, with offense. Any thoughts or questions before we move on? Say what? The sword was the word of God. Indeed. We see that in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, that, that the sword is the word of God. Absolutely. Thanks, Ms. Carroll, for a great question last week.
It's always good. Well, it's not always good. Eight out of ten times. Eight out of ten times. It's good to chase rabbits. And it's good that we can do that on Wednesday evenings. This is an in-depth Bible study. We, we, we slow down and we walk through passages of Scripture in depth. And it's okay to chase rabbits. It's good to ask questions. It's good to mine the riches of God's Word. Uh, and it's good to go, to go in depth and think in that way. So, we pick up this evening in verse 59 of, of Matthew chapter 26. And verse 59 it reads, The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they could not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two who came forward stated, This man said, I can demolish God's sanctuary and rebuild it in three days. The high priest then stood up and said to him, Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. Then the high priest said to him, By the living God, I place you under oath. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Verse 64. You have said it, Jesus told him. But I tell you in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated at the, high, seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said he has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? Look, now you've heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? He's asking that question to, to the Sanhedrin. So here, um, here we see... Um, oh, and I guess the, the back, I should read the back end of verse 66. Then they answered, he deserves death. So we see Jesus being questioned... Uh, by the by, the chief priests and and leaders of the of the Sanhedrin, uh, the, the 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 great Sanhedrin, as it's referred to in in several passages of the New Testament, was basically the religious council, the Jewish council of leadership in the city of of Jerusalem. The whole council we have reference here, the Sanhedrin. Uh, it, it it need not denote all seventy members. The Sanhedrin was, was a, had 70 members, but it may just indicate that they hastily assembled in the middle of the night. And we know that, that, that the Jewish law required for 23 members to be there to make a quorum. Sanhedrin, or, or Sinadrion is the, is the Greek word there, it could refer to either a local Jewish tribunal. We see little Sanhedrins in, in, in countryside villages along the way. It could be a, a local Jewish tribunal. Or here, it could refer to the supreme ecclesiastical court of the Jews centered in Jerusalem. We, we call it the high council in some passages. But this was, this was the, the, the primary court of leadership and, and religious rule in, in Jerusalem. And it was centered there around the temple complex. Any questions about what the Sanhedrin is or what the Sanhedrin does? We know that... We know that were under the rule of the Roman Empire during this time. Uh, the Romans, and this was unique to the Jews. Everywhere else, everywhere else that the Romans conquered, they did not allow any degree of, of self-rule or self-government at all. Uh, but because of numerous rebellions, and because of the fact that the Jews were fiercely independent, Rome, some might say graciously, allowed... Uh, the nation of Israel to have a degree of autonomy, and so the Sanhedrin was kind of a kind of a political power, kind of a religious power, uh, but they were certainly the the council of the of the Jewish leadership seated in Jerusalem, and so they they had they had some political authority, but they always had to defer uh, to the Roman governor for approval of any decisions that they make, and that'll come into play here in our passage. Any thoughts or questions about the the council here? Well, we do know from the previous passage up up in verse uh, oh verse fifty six. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. So we know that the disciples scattered from the Garden of Gethsemane. We know that Peter's nearby. So we don't we don't know exactly how many are nearby. We know that Peter's lurking in the shadows near Jesus. Uh, John may very well have been close by too. We don't know that, but 
the details that John writes in his gospel lead us to believe that he was probably nearby somewhere. But most of the, most of the disciples had scattered. They maybe have gone back to the upper room. They may have gone back to where they had the Lord's Supper. We, we don't really know exactly where all they were. But, as we talked about last week, uh, I, know that, I know that Jim Oakley asked the question about a month ago, did the high priests need Judas to ID Jesus? Did they, did, didn't they know who Jesus was? Couldn't they have recognized Jesus uh, themselves? Did they need Judas' help? And... Uh, we, we, we know for sure the reason that they went to the Garden of Gethsemane in the middle of the night was to keep a low profile. Because of all the other followers of Jesus, not the twelve disciples, but the other followers of Jesus, uh, the, the, the high priests would have really stepped in it had they gotten in the middle of, of the crowds that supported Jesus. Yes, ma'am? Look at John 18. Verse 15. It reads, Simon Peter was following Jesus, as was another disciple. If I were a betting man, I would say that's probably John who wrote the book. Simon Peter was following Jesus, as was another disciple. The disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest, so he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. So we, we know that it wasn't just Simon Peter that was nearby. So th thank you, Miss Carol, that was, that was helpful. Um, but... but Many of the disciples had deserted him. And then, of course, the crowds who followed Jesus, the, the lowercase d disciples, they would have probably been asleep and in bed. They, they wouldn't have been up and, and, and going. That's why they did this under the cover of darkness. Good, good question. Any thoughts or, or any more questions about the Sanhedrin or the trial? Here we go. Um, verse, verse 60. Um, but they could not find any, that's referring to witnesses, they could not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. Some, some manuscripts, uh, so not, and there are, there's different kinds of Greek manuscripts, but some, uh, some manuscripts actually say explicitly false witnesses. They're not just saying witnesses came forward, they're saying false witnesses came forward. So we have reason to believe that the folks who did come forward were all liars. In the midst of this, in the midst of this sham kind of show trial, so the Sanhedrin tried to find witnesses, or particularly false witnesses, who could credibly testify that Jesus had violated the Old Testament law, so that they could find him guilty as quickly as possible. Again, that goes to the fact that the Sanhedrin is trying to do this quietly. They're trying to stay under the radar. They're not trying to garner a lot of public attention. Uh, because they know that in some respects Jesus was a very popular figure. And so they're trying to do this quickly and quietly uh, and get him out of their hair uh, as easily and seamlessly as possible. The Sanhedrin was obligated to interview witnesses separately and then compare their testimonies to determine if they were consistent. Inconsistent testimonies were considered to be invalid. So they had to get multiple witnesses separately to line things up. But we see in, in, in verse 60, finally two who came forward stated the same thing. So uh, something tells me that these two may have come together. They may have gotten their story from one another, and they may or may not have been interviewed separately according to the Old Testament rules. So we know that this, this is a bit of a sham trial. Uh, they were trying to make this as quick as possible. Verses 61 and 62 are, are the quotation of these false witnesses. That it says, I am able to destroy the temple of God. This saying is a, is a misquote of what Jesus said in John chapter 2. It was taken out of its context, it was a misquote, and it was easily distorted by Jesus' opponents. That is not what Jesus said in John chapter 2, but it is what they claim that He said in, uh, according to John chapter 2. Verses 61 through 63. The testimony here was based on a confused understanding of Jesus' statement from John 2. Since both 2 Samuel chapter 7 and Zechariah chapter 6 portrayed the Messiah or the, or the Son of David as the one who would build a temple for God, the high priest regarded this statement about building the temple in three days as a claim to Messiahship. 
So the high priest appears to use the titles Messiah and Son of God interchangeably in our passage today, suggesting that many Jews saw the title Son of God as a reference to the Messiah, and they used them one as one and the same in light of Psalm 2. And so uh, I, I mentioned this in passing on Sunday morning, uh, that that that. John, uh, John the Baptist calls Jesus the Son of God. He also calls him the, the Lamb of God. And so there's a number of different titles in the Old Testament that are used to refer. And we, in, in Christianity, we kind of dump them all on the Messiah label. But in the Old Testament, there were a number of different statements. There's the Son of God. There's the Son of Man. Uh, uh, Jesus says the word Son of Man in verse 64. And so there's the Son of God, there's Son of Man, there's the, the title Messiah, and uh, there's, there's, other, there's other, son, other titles like Son of David. There's all these different Old Testament titles, and it's debatable whether the Jews agreed that they were all a reference to the Messiah or not. Some Jews viewed all of those titles as a reference to the Messiah. Some Jews did not necessarily see it in that way. So uh, it's not necessarily... Uh, a one-to-one correlation. But here we see the way that the chief priests use Messiah and Son of God interchangeably. It suggests that many uh, of the Jews in this camp saw the Son of God as the Messiah, and that's one in the same title. I know it's confusing for us, because we, we just kind of dump all the titles on Jesus as if they're all equal and are all synonyms. But in the Old Testament passages, you'll see different titles used in different contexts. And not every Jew interpreted it to be a reference to the Messiah specifically. Any thoughts or questions about titles? That's a fun... I don't don't want to chase that rabbit too far. But titles are are fun. Okay. Um, Look at verse 63. Verse 63. It says that Jesus kept silent... Jesus' silence is a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. And Jesus' silence places the responsibility for his death squarely on his accusers. He didn't, he didn't open his mouth. He stayed silent, and the burden of proof was on his accusers. And when they say, tell us if you are the Christ, uh, we see here that Caiaphas wants Jesus to admit to this charge so that he can be accused of insurrection, not just blasphemy against the God of the Old Testament, but he, they want him to be accused of insurrection against the Roman government. And so by, by accusing him of a, of a political crime, not just a, not just a, 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 phil, a theological crime, by accusing him of a, of a political crime, insurrection against Rome, uh, he was able to be tried before Pilate for treason. And that's what gave the Jews the ammunition that they needed to take Jesus to the, uh, the Roman authority. Any, any questions about that? The relationship between the Sanhedrin and Pontius Pilate. Okay, let's keep, let's keep going. Verse 64. Verse 64. We see that Jesus' confession acknowledged that He is the Messiah and the Son of God. However, He countered confused interpretations of his messianic role by describing himself as the Son of Man. Both the Son of Man and the phrase coming on the clouds were drawn from Daniel chapter 7. Jesus' words confirmed that he intended this title, Son of Man, to express not just his humanity, but his identity as a king of heavenly origin who would reign over an eternal kingdom. We know that He was the the one who would make good on God's covenant with David. And so the words seated at the right hand here echo Psalm 110. Jesus' application of Psalm 110 verse 1 to Himself gave the impression that He was claiming to be equal with God the Father. That's that's a a bolder statement than the quote from Daniel. And so by, by, by referring to himself in, in Psalm 110, he's claiming equality with God the Father. And the unbelieving Jewish leaders regarded this as blasphemy. It's at that point that, they, that he had crossed the line for them. So um, 
a little bit more on this, on this blasphemy thing. Tearing one's robes was a common expression of deep grief and was customary, uh, a, Jewish, a customary Jewish response to blasphemy. However, because the robes of the high priest were considered to be sacred, according to Leviticus chapter 21, the high priest was prohibited from tearing his robes because they were sacred. So the priest who is in highest among his brothers... Uh, is, pro- is prohibited from tearing his garments, according to Leviticus chapter 21. Thus, the high priest flying off the handle in anger over Jesus' statement prompted him to commit a great act of sacrilege there among the Sanhedrin. So he managed to uh, really widely break the rule according to Leviticus chapter 21. And in doing so, he made a colossal hypocrite of himself right there in the Sanhedrin meeting. So, that's kind of a fun fact on the side. Um, not, we don't always pay attention to that. But, but, but we, know that, we know that tearing your garments uh, was a common sign of grief and mourning over death. It was also a, a common sign of, of grief if, if, uh, if, if they were in the presence of something blasphemous. Uh, but, but we do know from Leviticus 21 that the high priest was prohibited from doing that. But he did it anyway. Any thoughts about that? That's a fun little, fun little tidbit. He, yeah, yeah, he had pretty well, he had pretty well colored outside the box long before that point in this, in this affair. Verse 66, verse 66, um, we do know that, that blasphemy in the Old Testament, the execution for blasphemy was execution by stoning, and that is uh, told, that is made clear in, in Leviticus chapter 24. So execution by stoning was the prescribed Old Testament penalty for blasphemy. But we also know that the Jewish council there, the the Sanhedrin, they did not have authority from the Roman Empire to have capital punishment. And so they had to ask the Roman governor to put Jesus to death. They they did not have the authority to, to, to execute Jesus themselves. And so instead they defer to Pontius Pilate because the Roman army... Is, is the only authority permitted to have capital punishment in, in this situation. Thoughts or questions on that one? The, the capital punishment side, blasphemy, Leviticus 24, any of the above. Any questions on that? Comment. Yes, sir. Hmm. That's a... That's a great. That's a great point, Pat. Um, for our friends at home on YouTube, a great comment uh, from Pat Wood. He says that God, in His infinite wisdom, goes goes almost out of His way to make sure that Jews and Gentiles were both complicit in Jesus' killing. And so, so to for for us to blame the Jews for putting Jesus to death is is unfair. For us to blame just the Romans. Uh, for putting Jesus' to death is unfair also. We know that Jews and Gentiles were all complicit in the death of Jesus. What a, what a great point. And, and I'll chase that rabbit for a half a foot. Uh, not far. But, but because of the fact that for many years, for centuries in fact, many Christians, you know, Jewish or Gentile Christians in, in, in Western Europe, in, in Western civilization... The medieval church blamed the Jews for Jesus' death. And that contributed to the rise of anti-Semitism across Europe. And that medieval Catholics actively blamed the Jews for the death of Jesus. And so they laid, they laid all the blame at the, at the feet of the Jews, which, which helped stoke anti-Semitism across Europe. And that's an unfair claim. Because it was the Roman army that executed Jesus, not the Jews. We were, we were all... Guilty. Jews and Gentiles alike are all guilty and complicit in the death of Jesus. And to lay it at the feet of the Jews is, is unfair. Great point. Thank you, Pat. Any other thoughts or questions about this? Capital punishment. Verse 66. If Jesus 
If Jesus is lying by claiming to be divine, then indeed he deserves death from the standpoint of the Jewish law. The irony here is that he was executed because he told the truth. That's, that's the irony there, is that he was telling the truth, he was being honest, and yet they sought his head anyway. Look at verses 66 and 67. Oh, uh, I guess I should say this. Um, verses 59 through 66 are told in Matthew and in Mark, but not in Luke or John. So what we just looked at, this, this Sanhedrin questioning, is, is, is referred to in Matthew and in Mark, but not in Luke or John. So uh, I just want to keep, keep the lens of all four Gospels on our, on our eyes as we look through this, particularly the Easter story, um, because we get, we get tidbits from John that we don't get in Matthew. We get tidbits in Matthew or Luke that we don't get in John. And so keeping all four Gospels open, and, and I, I, I can't, I can't uh, endorse it enough. This is a great little book. It's called Christ Chronological, and it has color coding. I'm, I'm, I'm OCD. I need the color coding help. Uh, but, but Matthew is in blue. John is in purple. And by, by color coding and laying across the page... This is just for, I don't know if you can see this or not, but this passage is in all four Gospels. This passage is only in three of the Gospels. And so um, you see what is where, and different Gospels have different details as a point of reference. So this uh, questioning in verses 59 through 66 is only found in Matthew and in Mark. Verses 67 and 68, these are two, two verses, and I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on them, but I want to highlight a couple things about these two verses. Uh, then they spit in his face and beat him. They, they just answered, he deserves death. The whole Sanhedrin answered, he deserves death. So they spit in his face and they beat him. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? As they were, as they were slapping him and, and spitting in his face. So... We see this, this abuse on the part of the Jewish council. The religious leaders were beginning to assault him physically. And so, I've got a few things to highlight about this passage. Matthew 26, verse 68, is immediately preceding Peter's first denial. The parallel uh, book, this, this parallel book I just highlighted aligns Matthew 26, 68 with Mark 14, 65 and with Luke 22, verses 63 through 65. Those two passages, Mark 14 and Luke 22, are after Peter's third denial. So Matthew, what we just read, takes place before Peter's first denial. Mark 14 and Luke 22 tell us much of the same thing. And those are recorded after Peter's third denial. So, did Matthew get things out of order chronologically? Did Mark or Luke get things out of order chronologically? This is my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. It's not divinely inspired. It's not the Word of God. It's just my opinion. My opinion is that this, this slapping and beating, the fact that Jesus was, they committed battery against him, happened multiple times. And as they drug him from one place to another, I'm sure they were pushing him and slapping him and beating him and prodding him along the way. And so uh, we, know that he went to, we know that he went to Pilate's house, he went to Herod uh, Antipas' house, he went back to Pilate's house. And so we have, we have multiple places where he's basically drugged back and forth. And I believe that he was beat up the whole time. And so that's, that's just my opinion. I think, it, I think it happened before Peter's first denial and it happened after Peter's third denial. And it probably happened along the way beyond that. So that's just, that's just my opinion. But I do have a note about these couple of verses. Mark 14, Mark 14, verse 65 in particular, shows that the men covered Jesus' face before they beat him. We don't see that in Matthew, but we do see it in, in Mark. Jesus was expected to identify the abusers by name without seeing their faces or hearing their voices. This mock test of messiahship 
is probably based on a misinterpretation of Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11 said that the Messiah will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, nor will he judge by what he hears with his ears. And so uh, the, the Jewish council probably ripped Isaiah 11 verse 3 out of its context, and they viewed this to be some kind of a messianic test. If you really are the Messiah, then you'll know which one of us is slapping you and which one of us is, is beating you. A mock test. We, we do know that previously in Jewish history, uh, a man claimed to be the Messiah, and he was executed uh, because one of the proofs that he was not the Messiah was his inability to judge by smell. What a ridiculous way that they ripped this verse from Isaiah out of its context and applied that as some kind of a, a test about whether or not Jesus was the Messiah. So, um, so that... that whether or, not, whether or not it's a test from Isaiah chapter 11. The fact that they were abusive to him physically is worth noting on its own. But that gives a little more depth as to why they may have chosen to abuse him in this particular way. Any thoughts or questions about that? I, uh, I, know, that, I know that Jesus was beaten and abused physically in a number of different ways. And this was just the beginning of what would be a very long day, a long night and morning and into the day. Look at verse 69. Verse 69 of Matthew chapter 26. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant approached him and said, You were with Jesus the Galilean too. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. So this is the, this is the first of, of Peter's three denials. Luke chapter 22, verse 55, tells us that Simon Peter is one of several folks sitting around a fire. John chapter 18, verses 17 and 18, they tell us that it's a charcoal fire because it was cold out. We know that it's in the middle of the night, early in the morning, uh, we know that, we know that they, they built a fire to keep warm. So Jesus was probably out there among a crowd. Uh, and, and we know that it's a charcoal fire per John 18. John 18 also tells us that the female servant was the doorkeeper. Mark chapter 14, the, the parallel passage. This is in all four Gospels. Mark 14 tells us that this girl was a maidservant of the high priest. So that puts a little bit, a little bit more personal connection to it. That this was, this was a maidservant of the high priest's uh, home. So Luke, John, and Mark all give us additional details about Jesus' first denial. Or uh, Peter's first denial. But I do want to read one note from the, the ESV study Bible. What a great tool the ESV study Bible is. I, I commend it to you. It's a great, great reference. Peter was sitting outside, we read. Peter demonstrates courage by his presence in such a hostile environment. But that courage fails him when his own personal safety is threatened. This is The fact that Peter was there is one of those attaboy Peter moments. The fact that he even stuck near to Jesus is an attaboy Peter moment. But it was that, it was that courage uh, that, he, that he demonstrated that, was, that, that undermines itself when his own personal safety is threatened. Um, between, between Peter's first denial and second denial, we find something in the book of John. And it's only in the book of John. But John chapter 18, verses 19 through 24, give us a passage where Jesus is questioned by Annas. Annas and Caiaphas are both listed as high priests in different passages. Uh, uh, Jewish history books outside the Bible tell us that Caiaphas was the high priest at this point in time, but Annas was his father-in-law, and Annas was a former high priest. And I've, I've thrown this word around since Pastor Jim retired, but, but Annas is viewed as kind of, a, kind of a high priest emeritus. He still had a place of honor. He, was still, he still had kind of, a, kind of a soft power function among religious leadership. And so Annas was still an influential figure in, in, in Judaism,
He wasn't the high priest. Caiaphas was the high priest. But Annas was a former high priest. And so he's, he's referred to in several passages of the New Testament as the high priest because he was earlier the high priest. So that, that, where, that passage where Annas questions Jesus is unique to John. It's only in John chapter 18. It's not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But it comes between the first and second denials of Peter in, in John chapter 18. So, in verse 71 of Matthew 26, verse 71... When he had gone out of the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. Verse 73, After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, You certainly are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. Then he started to, to curse and swear with an oath. I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is a, a low point in, in Peter's life. Uh, this, is, this is the time where, where Peter more or less abandons his Lord, and, uh, and, and he, he weeps bitterly. Because of the fact that he had abandoned his Lord. So, John chapter 8, this, this, this second and third denials are in all four Gospels. So, uh, the first denial was in all four Gospels. That little section in John 18 is unique about Jesus being questioned. But then the, third, the second and third denials are in all four Gospels again. John 18 tells us that the third denial was to a relative of the man whose ear Simon Peter had cut off. Malthus was the, the high priest's servant. So John gives us a little more detail, tells us that the third denial was a relative of the man whose ear he cut off. So somebody's got an axe to grind against Peter at this point. Uh, so that's a little tidbit that's not found in Matthew. Luke chapter 22, particularly in verse 61, it says the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So in the, in the midst of Peter denying Jesus, Luke 22 tells us that that Jesus looked and, and saw Peter, and their eyes met, which I'm sure added to the fact that he wept bitterly. Mark chapter 14 tells us that the cock crows after the first denial, and again after the third denial. That is unique to Mark. It's not in, it's not in Matthew, Luke, or John. It's only in Mark do we see that extra little tidbit. But in Mark 14... Uh, we see that the cock crows after the first denial and again after the third denial. And Mark goes farther in detail and says uh, that, that Jesus had told Peter, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. So did the rooster crow once after the third denial? Or did the rooster crow twice once after the first denial, one, once again after the third denial? And, uh, and John... Uh, John chapter 14 actually says that, that when Jesus predicted Peter's denial, he, he did so and he said, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. So that, that extra cock a doodle do is only found in Mark. It doesn't really change anything, but that's just a little extra detail that Mark gives that, that Matthew, Luke, or John all uh, don't have. That's a, that's, a great, that's a great point, Miss Carol. Thank you. Uh, for our friends at home, Miss Carol said so wisely. Don't you think Mark had that extra detail in there because Mark had such a close relationship with Peter? I think the answer is yes. Uh, church history for years has, has, has affirmed that, that the, the primary source, the, the apostolic authority, if you will, behind the book of Mark was Simon Peter. We have reason to believe that Mark wrote down Peter's version of events uh, and Peter's testimony, and, and that's why most biblical scholars for, for, for centuries now have believed the legitimacy of Mark. We know that there's an apostolic authority tied to each and every book of the New Testament, and that Jesus gave the capital A apostles an authority that he doesn't give the rest of the church. And so uh, John Mark, uh, and I mentioned this last week, I think, John Mark uh, 
was with Paul and Barnabas on Paul's first missionary journey in the book of Acts. And then, and then they ended up parting, uh, parting company. Um, and, 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 then, and then Paul ended up taking Silas on, on his second, third missionary journeys. But, um, but John Mark is, uh, is, is believed to have had a very close personal relationship with, with Peter. And he probably was the, the, the scribe that recorded Peter's testimony. So Peter is probably the primary source behind the book of Mark. That's a, that's a great point. Thanks, Miss Carol. Great tidbit. Any thoughts or, or questions about that? Uh, there is a little bit of confusion. If you look carefully at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, particularly at the, at the second and third denials, it could be debated just how many accusers there were. Um, one talks about another, another woman. One says the same woman again. Uh, one talks about another guy. We, I mentioned that John mentions it was, it was one of Malchus's relatives who accused him the third time. Uh, and so there's a little bit of, of discrepancy in really who accused Jesus, or uh, accused Peter. Uh, but, but we know what, what is clear in this story is that, that Peter's denials numbered three. Uh, it doesn't say that he would be accused three times. In fact, we see kind of a kind of a mob rule out by the fire, and it may have been multiple accusers before each denial. So, so we do know that Peter denied Jesus three times. I'm certain he had more than just three accusers along the way. So, if you're if you're keeping notes of those details, we we have a record of three denials, but we have a record of of more than just three accusers in those denials. So look at, verse, look at verse 73 specifically. Galileans, Galileans spoke with an accent that distinguished them from the inhabitants of Judah. Side, side note, Judeans looked down upon Galileans because Galileans were thought to be less educated. They had a particular accent. Some of you, some of you like to think about accents and study accents. And there's so many accents in this country... Never mind accents in the British Isles of, of English. Uh, Scottish accents and Australian accents and all the different accents that even, even just the language of, of English. And so uh, there's a, there was a, a discrepancy in accents and Galileans spoke with an accent that distinguished them from Judeans. Judeans looked down upon Galileans. And so time and time again we see a reference to the fact that your, your accent gives you away uh, in, in, some of these, in some of these verses. The emphasis on Jesus' identity as a Galilean and as a Nazarene in these, in these verses. We see this referenced in verse 69, in verse 71, and in verse 73. We see three different references to the fact that he's either a Galilean or a Nazarene. Those, that emphasis may imply one of the arguments used to refute Jesus' claim as a Messiah. Because he, he did not come from Bethlehem, the city of David. This city is identified as the birthplace of the Messiah, according to Micah chapter 5. Thus, thus these, these folks who are making much of the fact that Jesus was from Nazareth, they were getting his birthplace and his hometown confused with one another. We do know that Micah 5 makes clear that Bethlehem is where the Messiah will be born. We've, we, we spent extensive time looking at the city of Bethlehem uh, over the past couple of months in the various angles of the Christmas story. We know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But very quickly, Jesus ended up moving to Nazareth with Mary and Joseph, and he was raised in Galilee. He was raised in that, in that culture. So he would have sounded like a Galilean, not like somebody who was from Bethlehem. And so the, they, they emphasized this, but in doing so, they, they undercut the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They're trying to make much of the fact that he's from Nazareth, um, when in fact he was born in Bethlehem all along. Thoughts or questions about that fact? That's, thank you, Miss Carol. Great. Um, that's right where I'm headed. Verse 74. Verse 74 uses the word curse and it uses the word swear. This is, this is most likely calling upon God's wrath to strike him if he's lying. Um, and that, that, was a, that was a common way of, of swearing an oath in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And in fact, 
Jesus uh, preached earlier in the book of Matthew, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't, don't swear oaths when you don't need to. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. But a common practice in, in Jesus' day and a common practice in the Old Testament was to basically call down God's wrath if I'm lying. Uh, one of the things that it just... It, it's like nails on a chalkboard. Just, it uh, it kind of gives me the willies whenever I hear it on television. But people, people say, I swear to God. And whenever I hear that, I'm just like, uh, uh, I just, it just rubs me the wrong way. And so, so what Peter is saying here is, if, if I'm lying, I want God to strike me down. Which, he was lying. And God should have struck him down. But God didn't, which is yet another evidence of God's grace. But, but here we see that's, that's what Peter was trying to do. He was, he was calling down curses upon himself in, in that way. Um, uh, verses uh, 71 and 72, it, uses, it, it doesn't use curse or swear, it uses the word oath. An oath was, was not necessarily profanity, but it was, it was calling upon something sacred. It was calling upon something sacred, like God's name, to, to guarantee that what one said was the truth. And so Jesus actually warned back in chapter 5 against making such oaths as they called into question one's ordinary truthfulness and their integrity. We saw in, in uh, chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. I mentioned it just a moment ago. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. You don't need oaths. You don't need all this other stuff to affirm the fact that you're being honest. Uh, I, have, I had a conversation just a couple weeks ago with a friend of mine, and you know how some things just rub some people the wrong way, but they don't really bother anybody else. One of my, one of my friends, he was talking about the fact, we were at bowling. I bowl on Mondays. Anyway, uh, we were in bowling, and he was, like, he was like, you know what rubs me the wrong way? It's when people goes, well, I'm not going to lie to you. you ever, I mean, do you ever hear people say, well, I'm not going to lie to you. And people will say that. And, uh, and he was like, man, that really rubs me the wrong way when people say that. It's if they're going to lie to me all the other times. And I, I, don't know, I don't know why, I just, that just popped in my mind. This is, it's a circus up here. I don't know what to tell you. But, but that's just another way of, 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 of reminding us that, that if, if you have to swear an oath, then are you lying to us all the other times you're not swearing an oath? And so Jesus makes clear in chapter 5, to let your yes be yes and let your no be no. An oath was not necessarily profanity, but it was calling upon something sacred to guarantee that what somebody said was the truth. Jesus warned against these as they call into question someone's ordinary truthfulness and integrity. Oh man, man! I bet, I bet when the I bet when the rooster crowed, Peter was like, "Oh, jeez, here we go. Here it comes. Here it comes. He 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 saw it coming." Yeah, poor old, poor old Peter. I, I love to give him an attaboy, but every now and then, yeah, there ain't no attaboy. It's a tough, tough deal. Uh, verse 75. Verse 75. We see Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. This is a direct fulfillment of verse 34. We studied that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a direct fulfillment of Jesus' prophetic word in verse 34. So, so Jesus called it, and Jesus knew what was going to happen, and Jesus said it, and it was so. And Jesus' word is good. And, uh, and, and Peter bears responsibility for failing his Christ in this hour when Jesus needed him the most. And so, in all four gospel accounts, we see derivatives of this same phrase, that he went out and he wept bitterly. All four gospels uh, give us that same tidbit that he, he wept. He either wept bitterly or he, he wept in agony or he, he went out and he fell down and he cried. Uh, and so we know, that, we know that Peter was overcome with guilt in a very, a very physical way here because he wept bitterly. That's true. That's a great point, Miss Carol. After this, we know that Jesus, that, that Peter did not deny Jesus again. After this, we'll get to the we'll get to the restoration of Peter at the end of Matthew, but uh, but we do know that 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 Jesus forgives Peter and restores Peter. 
uh, threefold. And um, we, know that, we know that Peter was used in a mighty way, particularly in the book of Acts in the early church. And, and, and Peter was faithful to his call. But Peter was a sinner that needed a Savior. And, and Peter needed to be forgiven. And, and Peter was a sinner too. And uh, I'm so thankful for the grace of God in Peter's life. And I'm so thankful for the grace of God in our lives. Oh my goodness, we've run over time. I'm so sorry. But we finished Matthew 26. Uh, prior to Matthew 26, we, as a general rule, had a one chapter per night kind of pace. And we blew that up in Matthew 26. There's a, there was a lot going on in this chapter. It took us a while to get through, but it's really good stuff. Um, and of course, in 27, we'll see the, the crucifixion of Jesus. And, and, and um, as, we, as we go through chapter 27, as we go through chapter 27, and, and even into chapter 28, where we read about the Easter resurrection, um, my hope is that we all come to terms with the weight of our own sin. And we come to terms with the cost of of our own sin and the fact that Jesus had to die in this way to bear God's wrath so that we don't have to. And uh, as we ponder the, the gravity of the death of Jesus, on the back end, let's always be thankful for how gracious He is when we don't deserve it. And that's the grace that Peter came to learn after the fact, and that's the grace that we have today, and I'm so thankful for it. Any thoughts or questions as we wrap up this evening? Thank you again for being here. I'm sorry it's cold over in the sanctuary, but I appreciate you being here this evening. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for Jesus and his ministry. God, thank you for the, the teaching lessons that we have from, from Jesus' words. Thank you for the pictures we see, the, the miraculous actions of Jesus. And help us to see Him for who He is. Help us to, like John the Baptist declared, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And God, I pray that we would worship Him accordingly. We are thankful for who Jesus is and what He has done for us. And God, I pray that You would use us to be the vessels You've called us to be as we share this great good news of grace and salvation that a lost and dying world needs to hear. Father, I pray that you remind us each and every day of who Jesus is and what he's done and help us to live our lives accordingly. We ask it all in his saving name. Amen.